And welcome to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. My name is Elisa Fishman, and I'm the host of today's program, First Person. Thank you for joining us. We are in our 17th year of the First Person program. Our first person today is Agi Geva, whom we shall meet shortly. The 2016 season of First Person is made possible through the, generous, through the generosity of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation, with additional funding from the Arlene and Daniel Fisher Foundation. We are grateful for their sponsorship. First Person is a series of weekly conversations with survivors of the Holocaust who share with us their firsthand accounts of their experience during the Holocaust. Each of our First Person guests serves as a volunteer here at this museum. Our program will continue through mid-August. The museum's website, www.ushmm.org, provides information about each of our upcoming first-person guests. Anyone interested in keeping in touch with the museum and its programs can complete the Stay Connected card in your program. I usually have one, but you probably can see what it looks like. Or speak with a museum representative at the back of the theater after our program today. In doing so, you will also receive an electronic copy of Agi's biography so that you can remember and share her testimony after you leave here today. Agi will share with us her first person account of her experience during the Holocaust and as a survivor for about 45 minutes. If we have time at the end of our program, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask Agi a few questions. We have prepared a brief slide presentation to help with her introduction. Agi was born Agnes Laszlo on June 2, 1930, in Budapest, Hungary. This map of Europe highlights Hungary. The arrow on this map points to Budapest. Oops, what happened? There we go. Agi was one of two daughters of Rosalia and Zoltan Laszlo. Here we see Agi and her sister Shosha. They spent the first six lives of their I'm sorry, first six years of their lives in a small farming village where their father managed a large farm. Here we see Aki's parents, Rosalia and Zoltan. Due to her father's failing health and anti-Semitic legislation prohibiting Jews from working in the agriculture business, the family moved to Mischholz, where Aki's mother managed a boarding house. This photo is of the house that was Aki's home. The arrow on this map of Hungary points to Mischholz. On March 19, 1944, the same day that German forces occupied Hungary, Agi's father died. Agi, her sister, and mother joined a group of 30 Jews sent to work in the fields outside the town. After a month, they returned to Mischholz, where they lived in the ghetto for a few weeks before being confined to a brick factory on the outskirts of town. The following month, the family was deported to Auschwitz. This map depicts the deportations of Jews from Hungarian ghettos to Auschwitz. Later, Agi, her mother and sister, were interned at the Plashov concentration camp. The arrow on this map of major Nazi camps shows the location of Plashov. When the Soviet army army approached Plashov in the fall, the entire camp, including the three women, were sent back to Auschwitz for a few weeks, then were moved to several labor camps. On April 28, 1945, Agi was liberated by American soldiers. This photo of Agi is from 1950, after she emigrated to Israel. Today, Agi resides in the Washington, D.C. area. She moved to the United States 13 years ago after living in Israel since 1949, where she worked in the insurance field for 32 years. She has two children, a daughter, Dorit, who lives here, and a son, Johnny, who lives in Israel. She has four grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. Agi speaks four languages fluently, Hebrew, Hungarian, German, and English. And with that, I would like to ask you to join me in welcoming Mrs. Agi Geva.
Aggie, thank you so much for joining us and for your willingness to spend time with us. In a short hour, you have so much to tell us that we're going to get started right away. So I'd like to start by talking about your life, your community, and your family in the years before the war. Can you tell me about that? The first six years, um, with my sister and Shosha and I spent in uh, Pogoin Pusta in a farm where my dad was the director of the place. And we had uh, quite a nice childhood, normal of course. Uh, my parents brought German nannies to look after us. That meant that we spoke German fluently before first grade even. And uh, my dad had a foreboding and kept on telling us to know the language well because we need something that can't be taken away from us. Later, it proved really useful. Then we went, moved to Mishkolz, as uh, Lisa already mentioned, that my mother had to look after us and provide for us because my dad got a heart attack that he never, ever recovered completely when he was fired in 1936 from his job. Anti-Semitism wasn't that much felt those, that year, actually, that it should come to this. But that's what happened. Now... I, I, earlier you told me that uh, you went to school in an unusual way. How did you get to school? Yes, that was in 1935. We went to school with a horse and carriage. There was a carriage with two horses, and uh, in winter there were warmed bricks under our feet and a blanket on our knees, and that's how I went to school. <laughs> a little bit different. A little different. So you, you said you learned uh, German. Did you also learn English? When we were 10, my dad thought that we should start another language, and we learned uh, English, actually. And at school we learned French and Latin and uh, what else? I think that's it. So, yes. so uh, the Nazis, as I, as I mentioned before, but the Nazis occupied Hungary on March 19th, 1944, um, which was a very important day in your life, and you've alluded to this already. This was the day that your father died. Um, can you tell me about what happened then uh, and then you went on to work in the fields and then in the ghetto. That day was really very traumatic. My dad died on that day and later we got news that the family from Budapest can't come to the funeral as they told Uncle Nazi arrived. And my mom understood that we are unoccupied and nobody could travel out of the cities anymore, no Jewish people. And uh, when we came back from the funeral, at every street corner, there was already a German soldier with a gun. And it was really scary. And they didn't lose time to change our lives completely in the next few days. We had to wear a yellow star. Every Jewish person had to wear a yellow star on, the, on our jackets or blouses. And we were really, really scared. What else will happen? Uh, there were rumors that who was ready to work in the fields and went to the municipality to swear loyalty to Hungary will not be deported. So my mom organized some friends, 30, 35 friends, and we went to the fields in Muhi Pusta worked there a few weeks. It was really traumatic. It was very hard to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and stay in the fields till the evening and do hard job that we never did before. But we didn't think that will be, that will be the easiest what, what came later. And so from there, you worked in the fields for a few weeks, hoping that you weren't going to be deported. But Next came the ghetto. One day they just told us that this morning we don't go to the fields, we are going back to Mishkolz. 
And we understood that they went back on their promise that we won't be deported. We were not sure yet. We were taken to the ghetto. That meant a small apartment with uh, five, six families. It was crowded. It was dramatic. It was uncomfortable. It was everything I can just tell you. It was not enough food. There was not enough water. Everything. We thought that's the worst that's going to happen to us. However, you so they, they the, the Nazis occupied Mischholz in March '44. By the middle of June, you're in a ghetto, and then you were taken to a brick factory for deportation. And yes. there were going to be trains waiting to take you. Can you put yeah. Them? Uh, the brick factory was actually a place that had no sides, it had no walls, it had only a ceiling, a roof, that meant that we could have escaped. But my mom was afraid that we are going to be seen and one of us might not make it and all her all her scare was all the time that we should stay together. So she didn't risk to escape. So we were waiting there for trains. And we saw that the trains will be like trains that we usually traveled in uh, with windows and seats and uh, sandwiches and conversations. And we were not afraid of it at all when the trains came. But when the trains came, that's what we saw. And these were cattle cars. And we could never, ever imagine that they can put people into these cattle cars and travel in them. But that's what happened. There were soldiers with guns all around us. We had to get into these cars. There were standing places. They put in as many people as they could and closed the door on us. And there is only a small opening, as you see, under the roof for light and for air that was really not sufficient. And the train started to move. And that was the worst of the worst part. Of course, I would have been happier back in the ghetto, as uncomfortable as it was. Uh, there were pregnant people, uh, women, there were sick people, there were teenagers, there were small children. It was, people were hysterical, crying. They couldn't stop crying. They couldn't stop yelling. They, they uh, some pregnant women fainted. It was an impossible situation that I can't even describe well enough in those, in those wagons. How long was the trip, do you recall? It was three days, and we didn't even know. We didn't know when it was day, when it was night. We didn't, I, I, it's undescribable. We thought it was the worst of the worst situation. And when the trains finally stopped, where were you and what did you see? Wherever we were, we didn't know. We were in Auschwitz, but we had no idea what it meant. We didn't know that it was a death camp. We didn't know it was a camp at all. We just didn't know. What we saw was the, that in minutes, they separated the men from the women. In minutes, we don't even know how, how it could happen so quickly. So a new hysteric started. People wanted to say goodbye to their brothers, husbands, sons. They begged the soldiers to do so. Of course, we couldn't get near them even. And in another few minutes, they were gone. They were just taken out of the station, and we never knew where they were going. And the women went in a different direction. And it was really important for your mother she, she started to realize, right, that it was, people needed to, to look like they could work or could work. And so what did she do? Actually, when my mom saw what's happening, she was really, really sorry that she didn't try to escape from the brick factory. Everything would have been better, she said. But here she started to go towards the at a certain point, we were supposed, all of us, to go. But she wanted to be there before to have a good look what's going to happen and what's going on there. And she told us just to walk with the group. She will 
go to the beginning of the lines, find out and come back to tell us. Of course, she was under gunpoint. She took a real risk, but she thought that the risk was worse if she wouldn't have known what's happening, and it turned out that she was right. She saw German SS selecting the groups that came in front of them, and she saw that families were torn apart immediately. When a girl was begging a, an officer to please let her stay with her mother or vice versa, they immediately separated between them. They didn't even give it a chance. And then she saw that all older people, sick people, people with a cane, with a child on their arm, were sent to the left side. She had no idea what it meant at that time. And she saw that to the right side were sent able-bodied people, more or less the same age. And then she heard that under 16, everybody was sent automatically to the left side. She didn't know at that point what it meant. And so your mother tried to make sure you all went to the same side. She figured that if we will not say that our real age, that was 12 and 13, we will say 18 and 19, they might select us to be together. So she told us to take out our scarves and bind it on a way on our head that will make us look older. And it was that way. It might make me look older even now. <laughs> and then she bound her head in another way that she thought it would make her look younger. And it was that way. So it might have been helpful, very helpful, because all the three of us were selected together to go to the right side. It was such a joy and such a relief when we found that we were all together again. But it wasn't very long-lasting. And so you told me that you had a bag with you. What did you take? You could bring a bag. What did you take? We could take a bag. We were told to go to our rooms before we left the house and just take stuff that we can carry alone. We don't need help with. So I personally took a book I was reading, a new watch, a doll, a dress. I don't know what my sister took. And your mother? Uh, what did adults take? Hmm? What did the grown-ups take? We didn't know that time, but it turned out that they took jewels, papers, documents pictures, family pictures, money. They thought that it might be helpful to, for bribery or for anything else. And when we had to put down our bags, there were such hysterics, cryings, beggings to hold on to them. But of course, the soldiers pointed out their guns on us and told us, put it down. And we had to. So can you tell me also a little bit about <coughs> the, the food that you had there and the bunks? I think before I have to tell you what happened at the next room that we were sent to. We had to undress completely and leave all our dresses in another corner. And the hysterics and the cryings and the beggings were even worse than ever before because uh, when the grown-ups, including my mom, thought that they might take the bags away, then at least their clothes will stay on. And they had in their pockets and in the linen of their dresses sewn in all these uh, jewels, monies, family pictures. <coughs> and when, they had, when we had to undress, that was our last hope of ever having anything that was connected to home or to 
save us somehow. So what was going on there, I can't even describe you. We were standing there without clothes. It was very humiliating and very uncomfortable. We never saw our mom uh, and their, her friends. And, and uh, it was very humiliating. But then more humiliations followed. We were shaved from all hair on our body. And then when we looked at each other, we couldn't even recognize each other. It was terrible. And as if this wasn't enough, we were sprayed with a disinfectant that only, uh, only animals were spared with. We knew that no humans can be sprayed like this. So I can't describe you, really, what it felt like. And then we were sent into the showers. We didn't know that we were lucky, very lucky, that from our showers there came, it came water. And we didn't know that in the other barracks, I mean on the left side, where people were, other people were sent, it came gas. We didn't find, we didn't know it then, and not, neither did my mom. So it was scary, not enough that time that we didn't know when we found out. And then we were taken to another place where we had to choose a piece of clothes and a pair of shoe. Nothing else, no underwear, no socks, nothing, just a dress and a pair of shoe. And whether it fit or not, it was absolutely not important to anyone. And then we were given bowls and blankets and taken to our barracks and the banks that looked like that, where five, six, seven people were sleeping on each bank. And when someone wanted to get up, all the six, seven had to get up. When someone wanted to turn over, everybody else had to turn over. It was horrible. But we had to do it. And from Auschwitz, you were selected for slave labor and sent to Plashov. These selections were really scary. Every single day we were counted at an apple, sale apple it was called. We were standing outside in lines for hours until the Kapos, Lagereltes, the Germans, came and started to count us. And then after it, it was the daily life in Auschwitz, we were, there were selections. And then one day we were all selected together, at least my mom and sister and I, and were sent to the railway station again and to the cattle cars again. At this time it took one hour, the trip, and we went to Plashov. That was a camp where the Schindler's List was filmed. And we had a very, very hard time there. So you were, they forced you to move rocks there, is that correct? That was our daily work, to pick up rocks and take them up a hill the next day to bring them back down. So it was also not productive, it was humiliating, it was uh, degrading, it was, and it was very hard work. You eventually went back to Auschwitz and faced even more selections when you returned. Yes. About Plashov, I just wanted to tell you still that there were not only prisoners like us, but there were, it was a camp also of uh, uh, murderers, burglars, the, the, from the prisons were taken there straight. And we were scared every single day, not only from the Germans, but also from our fellow prisoners. We had to look behind us. It was really scary. And then we were taking, when we heard the cannon shots, we thought that the Russians are maybe liberating us, coming to the camp. But then the Germans quickly liquidated the camps, and we were sent back to the railway station. And this time we were really scared. We were very weak, looked very bad. And 
hopeless. And this wagon trip took one day. And my mom tried to console us that we have been to the worst places already. We have been to Auschwitz, we have been to Plashov, and it can't be worse, she said. But when the doors opened, then we simply saw where we were, and it was back in Auschwitz. It was really something that we have never, ever thought that it might happen, and we were hope more hopeless than ever. And what happened in that um, selection there? My mom saw that there was one officer selecting, surrounded by soldiers, keeping their guns on the person who was selected. And she told us that because we are in such bad condition, she thinks she's in the best condition, she will go first, and my sister be second, and I look worse than the two of them, I should be the third. And she took a big chance here to tell us, follow me wherever I will be sent. And in case it's impossible, then ask for a working camp. The Germans will need workers all the time, so just try. She was, uh, the, the selecting officer was Mengele, that we had no idea who he was that time. And we found out that we were more scared, but it was, we didn't know. So he sent my mom to the right, and then she, he sent my sister to the right, and me he sent to the left. And I looked at him and I told him, please, no, please, I would like to go to that side, pointing to the right. And he asked me why, what is there? I told him, I suppose it's a working camp. And then he realized we were talking German. He told, you are a Hungarian transport. That's how we call, they called us all the time, transport. How can you speak German that well? And here came the point where my dad was right. Hadn't I speak, spoken German, I wouldn't have made it. And he somehow, he liked the idea. He had told me, how do you speak German? And uh, I started to ask questions, and he told me, okay, go to the right. When my mom saw the conversations, she was sure she will never ever see me again, and she knew exactly what's going to happen to me. She fainted. When I got there, she didn't even know that I was saved. So people sometimes ask you, were you afraid of him? He's a well-known... Uh, yeah, people kept uh, on asking me, weren't you afraid of Mengele, talking to him? And, and, and I thought, no, I was afraid of my mom. <laughs> he told us. She told us what to do, and I was supposed to do what she wanted me to do. So at one point, your mother had you remove your glasses. Why did she do that? There were selections as I told you, daily. And there was for factory workers in Germany. So sometimes they looked at strong feet, strong hands, strong eyes. And when they looked at the eyes, then mom used to take off my glasses, fold it into the side of her shoe to hide it, that I shouldn't look different than everybody else and we should be able to stay together. And these glasses we brought back. I don't know how she did it, but I was saved because of it. Another story you were telling me about while you were there is the story of Lily, who was an opera singer, and she was in the camp with you. Yes, she was also with her sister, and her mother was sent to the left side at the selections, and she was really desperate and very sad. She was some 10 years older than my sister and I, and her sister. Um, we found out that she was an opera singer in my hometown in Mishkols, and we started to ask her maybe to sing for us. And she was so sad and so weak and so hungry and so desperate and so everything that it took a long time to persuade her. But when she started to sing, I can't even tell you what it meant to all of us. If I close my eyes, I just thought I'm back in the opera house in Mishkols, listening to opera arias. She sang us beautifully, and every couple of days she did sing us, and also the Germans were 
touched by it and invited her to sing in their headquarters that we were scared every time when she had to go there whether she will come back. Um, so while you were, th so you're back to Auschwitz the second time, and from there they do a selection for a work camp in Rochlitz, and uh, that was late 1944. So where, what happened when they took you? There was a selection, how many people went, and what did you do when you got to Rochlitz? The, from Rochlitz, actually, they asked for people, for workers, for uh, aeroplane spare part screws to, to in, in the factory from aluminium. We were given, a, we, we arrived to Rochlitz after a three days trip in the wagons. That was worst that I can imagine from all the trips because it was winter. It was so cold and we were so not prepared, not, uh, we had no clothes, we had no food, we had no warm drink, we had nothing to keep us warm. And this trip was dangerous. We thought we'll never make it without getting some part of us frozen, but somehow we did it. And when we got to Rochlitz, um, it was a relief to know that we were in a school, actually, where we were studying how to make these uh, small screws for the real factory. And you told me while you were in the school, you ended up with a pencil and a piece oh, of paper. When they gave us, when they gave us, but for me personally, a pencil, I, I was really even more happy than with a piece of bread. I found myself being responsible and a human being again. As we were tattooed, tattooed in Auschwitz when we came the second time, actually, we had not enough humiliation, it seems, yet. They tattooed on our left arm a number that we were supposed to be just this number. And it said Auschwitz, I mean, just the letter of A and the number. And when I got to, to Rochlitz and, and got this pencil, I felt human again. We were sitting on chairs in front of tables that we haven't done the whole year before. So you were telling me too that um, you were making screws for airplane parts and your mother engaged in some acts of sabotage while you were there. From Rochlitz, we were sent to Kalf in Stuttgart to the big factory. And that was the real factory where the screws really went out to the aeroplanes. And my sister was working at the control panels and I was making the screws actually. And my mom was controlling, one was uh, at the um, filing stone where if the screws were too small, they were thrown away, and if they were too big, then she could file them to the actual size it was supposed to be. And then one day we heard that uh, my, our, our mom fainted, and uh, it turned out that she pressed the screw too hard to the filing stone, and the stone exploded, and she got so scared that she fainted. <laughs> And then she was explained, they took her to headquarters and explained to her that you can't press this screw so hard to the filing stone because it's very hard to get a new one in to order one, it takes time. And until then the crates with the other, the red screws will stand in the doorway and they can't be sent out to the airplanes. And here she got an idea that maybe she can help, be helpful a little bit and do this several times that the crates shouldn't get to the airplanes. She called it mini sabotage and she kept on doing it and the stone exploded, she fainted and we waited for weeks until to get a new stone in and get the crates out. My sister and I didn't know about this, we found out only after the liberation and uh, nobody knew she was very scared that it will be discovered. So.
so. The work there was very, very hard because it was at night. We worked from seven in the evening till seven in the morning. It was impossible to stay alive, alive, awake in that monotone humming uh, big machines at three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. It, everybody was, was almost falling asleep already. It was very hard to, to do this work for so, so long and for so many nights. So finally, in February 1945, you were sent out of the factory of Kalv on a forced march. Tell us about that and what you thought was going to happen to you. Actually, we were told one day just to stand at the door and be ready to leave. And we thought that we, it was meant to be ready to leave. We are waiting for transportation to the wagons and traveling somewhere. We were not that scared anymore because we knew that the Allies were already nearing. We knew it somehow. We were not supposed to know anything. We were not supposed to be shown. We were not supposed to be, that's why we worked at night. They didn't want the villagers and the town people to know that there are prisoners, that there are Jews in that factory. And the Germans were rather successful. They didn't, nobody ever saw us. And when we went to the door to wait for transportation, it was night, of course. It was dark outside. We couldn't imagine that we were supposed to walk. They told us there is no transportation, just start walking. It was impossible to imagine that in this cold German winter, as you know, you knew, we had only one piece of clothes and one pair of shoe that wasn't a shoe anymore even. And without underwear, without gloves, without scarves, without anything, just walk. But we had to. And it was mostly at nights. And in the mornings, they looked for barns for us to sleep in. And we, they told us to look for food in the barns. So what did we find? Raw potatoes, raw cabbage. And I can't tell you how hungry we were and how weak we were and how desperate we were. So you were walking uh, more or less towards a train station where the guards were supposed to be um, rearmed with guns. And when you got to the station, what happened? First of all, we were walking 400 kilometers. We were supposed to arrive to Dachau or to Mauthausen that we didn't make anymore. And we were told to walk quicker to, because if we want to go continue by train, we have to catch a train and we should be able to get there on time that we couldn't, of course. Nobody could walk anymore. Nobody was strong enough to walk quickly. We, we were happy to walk at all. And most of us <coughs> couldn't walk anymore, even including I, me. And we didn't know how lucky we were also here that on other death marches, when someone couldn't walk, they simply sat down at the side of the road and they were shot and left there. And at least our guards didn't do that. They helped us and helped us to walk. And towards what actually? We found out that these trains that we were supposed to reach, they were bringing ammunition and guns to execute us. Now, some of us believed it. We didn't, know how, we didn't know what to believe anymore, but we had so little strength. I personally didn't care. Execution, no execution, I can't walk anymore. I just couldn't. And the despair and the hunger and the cold, it was so cold and windy. It was so hopeless, everything. So somehow we got to the railway station and the train was not there anymore. They were gone. 
And so our guards told us the guards were four uh, German soldiers and two officers, one of them a woman. They told us just to go back to the forest and keep walking. That was really the worst of the worst in my whole uh, life. I couldn't, I could hardly get to the railway station and then be told that you won't go on the trains and you won't, I, I wouldn't say that they told us not, we won't be executed, but we're not supposed to know it and we just overheard the German guards. <coughs> but it came out to be true. I just didn't know how I got back to the forest and all this hopelessness and this cold to go through it again. And then suddenly we looked around and there were no guards around us. And it was unbelievable. And we started to whisper and have some rumors, what can be, what can be the reason, until one of the couples told us that from this day, 28th of April 1945, we are free. So until we heard this word, it, this became the best of the best day in my life. But I really thought that I will never be able, I will not be free anymore, ever. So what happened then? And I think there were 180 Hungarians, 179 Hungarians. What did you? There were 180 Hungarians, 20 Polish people, and 180 Hungarians. When we found out that we are free, there were 180 opinions <laughs> exactly where we were and what we should do. Everybody had a different idea. Of course, we were very happy, but still cold, still weak, still hungry. My mother somehow found some 35 women at the same opinion to go out <laughs> to the same direction that we started out. And we were still scared, but we were afraid to get into, to fall into German hands again, or, or uh, who will be our liberators, or who will be the soldiers we are going to find on the way. And then luckily we heard English speaking, an English speaking group, and we found out they were Americans, and these were the first Americans I ever saw. And when they saw us, they told they never in their life they saw a bunch of women so ugly, so, di so dirty, so bald, and so weak. They just took us to their headquarters and really looked after us, and it was very nice. So from there, you, your mother decided that you should go back to Mischholz. What was it like? to go back? My mother decided to go back, actually, because she wanted to know who remained alive from the family. Uh, they would have the United Restitution Offices where the Americans sent us from their headquarters to Innsbruck. We stayed there eight months. It took my, months, eight, my mom, mommy eight months to decide what to do. We wanted so much to go to Palestine, to, to the States maybe, anywhere else but back to Mishkolz. She insisted. So when we, we were, when we went back, we had a bad surprise. The, our hotel was completely empty, almost. So she couldn't open it and start, start it anew. That's what she wanted to after she found out who was alive from the family. She went to the municipality, she got some help, she, and they went to the neighbors, and she found every curtain. She told that this is mine, this bed is mine, this carpet is mine, and they helped her to refurnish the hotel and start it all over again. But when I went to school the next time I could, one of the schoolmates asked me, what, why did you come back? And the other one asked, we never thought to see you again. 
So the anti-Semitism was even worse than it was before. So how could I go and sit in that school room and study? I went to the principal, I told him, no way. Just let me make the test twice a year and I'll study at home and that's how I'm going to finish my studies. And from there you went to Israel? Yeah, that one was day, not a uh, easy to <laughs> We could sign up as soldiers for Palestine to fight for Israel because I was past 18 already. And uh, I did so. And my mother was desperate. She told, I saved you and I wanted just to stay together. And now you want to go and leave me here? But my sister and I, we had to. We just couldn't stay there. The communism was already on in Hungary. And they didn't let out older people, they let out only us, the younger ones, uh, with the hope that the parents will be able to come. We, we, they will let them come after us. And we had to take this risk. My mom couldn't understand how, how we could do this to her. As bad as I felt that time, it was so wonderful later, that six years later, they let her come. And Every single day she told us thank you, that we did this, that, that we left and we could bring her to Israel. Um, my mom remarried and, and this was our attorney of law of the family actually, who lost his wife and six-year-old son in Auschwitz. And they met and they remarried and he came with her to Israel. Uh, to a kibbutz where my sister is until now. And she lived till 97 and a half. And this family, you will see now, nobody, not one of them would be alive today if my mom wouldn't have saved us. Today, of course, we are more, but that was the thought all the time when we looked at this picture. Here my mom is at, in her last year, 97 years old. And the next picture will be actually... Oops. <laughs> okay, when, when my sister became 75 years old, we Sorry. went back to Hungary, to the farm where we started out from. I, I don't... It's not you here don't have it? Never mind. I don't know what happened to it. And uh, we took a picture near the fence uh, when we were when we saw the picture of when we were five and six years old, and now we were 75 and 76. We said, 70. <laughs> and there is a picture of it. We look different. <laughs> I have it if you want to come see it, but it's disappeared from this slideshow. And uh, if you have questions uh, until here, I will be very glad to answer about the deportation or about what happened before or after, so. Okay, so please. try to make your questions as brief as possible. I believe we have people with microphones coming down, so if you want to raise your hand. Anybody has, uh, there's a, I think a gentleman in the back there waving his hand. You might have to repeat. <laughs> you mentioned earlier a person called a kapos. Um, could you translate that? What, what is yes. a kapos? Yes. There were among the Polish prisoners chosen kapos and lagereltes. The kapos meant um, commandant, actually, or lagereltes meant that they were responsible for the same, um, uh, not banks, barracks. There were 200, 250 people in the barracks and that somebody had to be responsible. And there were always the Polish uh, prisoners because they spoke fluently German. They were already four, five years in, in the camps when we arrived, the Hungarian group. And uh, they were called Kapos and Lagerelteste. It just means that they were responsible. They were... Uh, it means older, elder. Lager, eldest means elder. He was, she was the eldest, not necessarily in age. Does this answer your question? Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, back there. Yes, 
man, I wanted to know, uh, do you hold any uh, like bitterness or hatred towards the uh, German people? German people meaning German people. It's, today we are in the third, almost fourth generation since then. So whom am I supposed to hate, actually? These are not the same people who did all this to us. That's what you meant? Yes. So that, uh, my sister, for instance, she doesn't speak German. She, I, she spoke German. She wouldn't speak German for anything. She, she just can't bring herself to, to, and to buy anything that's German made. Many people came to this conclusion. They wouldn't buy a German car, a German toothbrush even, and they wouldn't speak the language. I do like to speak the German language, and I look at it in a different way. You, you, seem so, yes, please. you seem so articulate and educated. I was just wondering, did you complete your education or go on to college? I finished my education in Hungary with the matriculation. That was the minimum that could be done till there. When I came to Israel, there was a problem because I spoke German and Hungarian but nobody want, and um, English. Nobody in Israel wanted to hear anyone talk English or German. Hungarian, nobody understood. So it was. <laughs> so I had a problem, and uh, so somehow it stopped there, where I I couldn't go on because until I learned Hebrew, I was already many, married and had children, and uh, it went into a different direction. Uh, you said you signed up for the uh, military for Israel after you got back to your hometown. Um, what sort of duties did you do as a in the military? Well, um, I signed up, but they stopped the group in uh, Marseille. We couldn't get to Palestine before Israel became Israel. And when we got to Israel, then the army for women wasn't like today that it's automatic and they are obliged to serve uh, two years, um, the boys three years. And I had to wait until there was a group big enough to go to the army, but I married before, so I never got to the army. But my daughter, my son-in-law, my son, everybody were in the army for quite a while, for a long time. Here's a question. Uh, yeah. All these things you described are incredibly difficult. Um, what kept you going? Was it faith? Was it something like maybe one day that you'd be free? What was it that kept you going on days that were very difficult? Only my mother and my sister. That uh, I didn't dare to show them that I was so desperate, and they didn't dare to tell them that I thought that I will never ever be free again and go to school again, and have a normal meal again, and, and uh, just to be living a normal life again. So I didn't tell them how desperate I was, and I never tried not to cry in front of them. And I suppose my sister had, this, had similar thoughts, but it was mostly for my mom and my sister, and of course, Faith, also. Let's just wait for the microphone. There's a gentleman right here in the white shirt. <clears throat> Other than everything, what were there any foods that you missed the most, like uh, you know, as a child or when you were uh, imprisoned? Did you miss so, like your mother's cooking the most, or any dishes from home back in your homeland the most? Anything specifically? What I miss the most, the most. <laughs> I'll tell a small story in between here. What I missed most was freedom, to do what I wanted to do. And until today, there isn't a single morning that I shouldn't say a silent prayer, a thanks to be free. That's what I missed most. But when the soldiers, the Americans, took us to their headquarters, 
they went out shopping one day and they asked every third year something of us, what would we like? They wanted to give us something and everybody asked for, for uh, not everybody, I mean some people asked for a cookie, some people asked for a, a schnitzel, for a sweater, for a, a chocolate, and I asked for lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's what I not missed, but I thought that might make me look better, happier, I don't know. <laughs> and they brought me. Answers your question? Uh, there's some all the way in the back. I, I wanted to know, were there any things you learned from your sister or your mother about their experience only after leaving Auschwitz that you were able to sort of talk about um, and that you learned about your experiences that you weren't able to discuss trying to be so strong in the midst of it all? Yes, that's a very, very popular question actually. They never wanted to talk about it anymore. My sister until today will never mention never answer a question. My mother didn't want to hear about it. You surely heard about the 50 years silence that happened after the war immediately. And I didn't want to take part in it. My mother, I, when I, I so much wanted to know her point of view and her uh, uh, attitude and her ideas. She told, you are free, never think back anymore. We went through hell. We are free, we don't talk about it anymore. We don't think about it anymore. And for a while I believed maybe that's right, but then I thought that it's not. And uh, with them I couldn't discuss it anymore. But then I thought that somebody has to talk about it. And uh, when I heard that there are people who don't even believe that it happened and are doubtful and think that it was propaganda and it never really happened, I started to talk in schools and, and wherever I found it important and wherever I asked to talk. And when I came to the States, I volunteered the first week in this museum already. And I was sent out to many, many places, to universities, colleges, schools, to tell the story. And, uh, but my mother and sister, they didn't want to share it. They couldn't. We have time for one more question. Uh, there, okay, someone's pointing over here. Was there someone here? Okay, I saw, uh, right here, young man. How old were you when you were freed? How old I was when it started? When you were free. When, when, when I was? When you were freed. I mean, I was freed. It was a year after, it, I was 15. And the happiest person in the world, I suppose. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much. So I'm going to turn back to, uh, and she'll stay around afterwards to, to answer some questions. Um, I'm going to turn back to Aggie in a moment to close our program. But I'd like to thank all of you for being here very much. I hope you can come back. It's our final week, actually, of the first person, sorry, our final week of the first person season is next week. And then you can look for the program in 2017. It's our tradition at first person that our first person has the last word. But before we turn back to Aggie, for those who didn't get a chance to ask her a question during our Q&A period, she will stay on, she will come actually to the back uh, to, of, of the theater so you can uh, feel free to ask a question, shake her hand, or get your photo taken with her. She also is willing and happy to show you the tattoo that is on her arm. Um, she will come to the back of the theater. And with that, I will turn back to Aggie for the last word. I thank you to be such good listeners that really you, you give me so much uh, sympathy and, and uh, courage, to courage that I should be able to talk and to able to tell the story without a single disturbance. So really thank you. But I have to tell you that it's not exactly how it happened. It was so much worse. It was so, there was so much cruelty and atrocities around me. And, and uh, if I would tell you exactly how it happened and would mention all those, those horrible things, 
I wouldn't be able to keep on talking about it. So just that you should know it wasn't exactly that way. Thank you, Aki.